We're here today talking with Dan Humphreys about some of the myths and truths about uh, physical activity uh, and disability. Um, Dan, welcome. Thank you. Um, just want to talk about these uh, seven myths that Blaze mm -hmm. Sports has identified and kind of, kind of get your opinions on them. Sure. The, the first myth is that people with disabilities lack stamina. What, what would you have to say about that? Well, uh, engaging in physical activity increases stamina in people with disabilities as, just as it does with people in the general population. Some types of disabling conditions are known to episodically affect stamina, but appropriate exercise, an appropriate exercise regime can help alleviate those symptoms. Um, there's research out there on different types of physical disabilities that prove uh, uh, an exercise regime can alleviate the symptoms of their condi condition and get them more healthy. You've done a lot of coaching in your career, and I know particularly you've done a lot of wheelchair basketball mm -hmm. coaching. I, I, wouldn't you say that wheelchair basketball is a, is a sport that requires stamina? I would say so. You're looking at 40 minutes of game time. Um, quite often you have one or two players that are out there for the majority of that time. And when you think about wheelchair basketball, all the propulsion is done by the arms. So it's not like an able-bodied basketball where you're running and jumping with your legs, doing your ball handling and shooting with your arms. 100% of your movement is dependent upon your arms and your upper body, depending on how much upper body musculature you have as a result of your disability. So stamina is very important for wheelchair basketball to be able to execute at the end of a game. And it can certainly be developed through a proper exercise program, through proper, a proper practice program, and strength and conditioning programs. I know a lot of wheelchair basketball programs uh, and, and competitions um, aren't necessarily set up to be exactly like uh, a high school or a college setting where they travel and play a game and then come home a few days later and play another game. Very often times it's, it's mostly tournaments. So what, what's a typical tournament like for a wheelchair basketball player and how would their stamina potentially impact their performance in, in a situation such as that? That's a great question. Uh, the, the typical wheelchair basketball tournament is usually one or two days of games and each day consists of three, possibly four 40-minute basketball games. <laughs> that requires stamina, That doesn't requires it? stamina. You don't find too many able-bodied teams playing more than one game in a day, or if they do, it's two games. And typically that's just one day. Um, but again, it's, it's usually one to two, sometimes three days of competition that have a minimum of two games per day. And again, upwards of three, possibly four. Um, so that, that does require stamina, not just for those 40 minutes, but it requires preparation leading up to that weekend, uh, proper nutrition, proper sleep, making good decisions for that whole week before to prepare your body to go through that grueling effort, being smart between games, hydrating, making sure you're taking in nutrition between those games so that you can put the work you've done to create that stamina to use time and time and time again throughout that tournament. Sounds like very much the same sorts of advice you'd give to uh, an athlete without a disability. Absolutely. We've, um, there have been different uh, uh, surveys done out there between uh, able-bodied coaches and uh, disabled coaches, or coaches who coach people with physical disabilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, what they found is there are far more similarities than differences. No matter what type of athlete you're dealing with, if it's male, female, uh, an able-bodied athlete or an athlete with a disability, each athlete's unique and you have to take their certain situation into consideration as you coach them. Uh, for an able-bodied athlete, you could have family issues they're dealing with, school issues. Um, a teenage athlete certainly comes with their own set of issues. It's no different from a disabled athlete's point of view. Um, you just have the, the disability to take into consideration what different effects that disability may have on that athlete. Um, so it's, you know, coaching is coaching and if you're a good coach, you're coaching to the individual anyway and it just takes a little more effort to learn what that individual person's situation is so that you can coach to their strengths. Great, thank you. Well, well let's move on to, to myth number two. Okay. Individuals with disabilities injure easily. I, I've been to a lot of uh, wheelchair and, and many other disability sport games, but I've seen a lot of wheelchair basketball and, and certainly a lot of wheelchair rugby. And <clears throat> those are not games for the faint at heart. Uh, no, there's, uh, even in wheelchair basketball, there's a lot of contact. Uh, um, we don't like it when someone watches a wheelchair basketball game and compares it to gladiators or a rugby game, but <laughs> it happens. People fall out of their chairs. There's contact. There's hard fouls. Um, people do get knocked out of their chairs. 
Um, when you're talking about rugby, obviously that's a, virtually a full contact sport, chair to chair. And in rugby, we're talking about people who um, are quadriplegics. Uh, they have limited function basically from their neck down, and they get knocked out of their chairs and they hit the ground. Uh, and I, I've seen really in my 12 years of experience, um, anecdotally, I've seen no more incidents of injury in wheelchair sports than I have in able-bodied sports. So it's possible for a wheelchair athlete or an amputee athlete to become injured, but are, are they any more susceptible to injuries than the able-bodied athlete? There are particular conditions that could make them susceptible to injuries. For instance, athletes with brittle bone disease. And I have had wheelchair basketball players with that condition that have played. They've gotten cleared by their doctor, and we do have to take some more precautions. Um, if they do go down, we want to make sure that they are okay. But if they're a properly trained athlete, they're not going to be more susceptible to injury than an able-bodied athlete. When you're talking specifically about wheelchair athletes, obviously they're using their arms and their shoulders much more than God <laughs> intended them to, or nature, if you will. So they do need to make sure that as they're conditioning and they're doing their strength and conditioning program, they're doing their practice program, that there's a balanced effort there between pushing, pulling, between working the, the muscles that are propelling the wheelchair and uh, the muscles that would counteract those motions so they have a healthy and balanced shoulder joint. Um, if athletes don't do that, they could be more susceptible, but that'd be just like an athlete who develops their quad muscles and not their hamstrings. They're going to have knee problems. So it, it certainly sounds like what you're saying is that a wheelchair athlete that plays a sport like wheelchair tennis, for example, mm -hmm. or maybe does road racing, does have the possibility perhaps of overuse injuries to their shoulders or, or perhaps their elbows or even their wrists and hands but not unlike an able-bodied athlete that's a distance runner and the concerns Absolutely. that they would have with shin splints and uh, arthritis in the lower joints and things of that nature. Absolutely and just like an able-bodied person needs to take precaution in both additional exercises and movements they do to prevent those types of injuries and uh, therapies they do such as hot cold therapies and, and uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Um, wheelchair athletes need to use the same things. They need to be smart about what they're doing, how they're training, what they're training to make sure they're putting themselves in a situation to be healthy and successful. So what would be your advice to someone who is considering uh, initiating uh, an athletic type program or an exercise program for people with disabilities um, insofar as ensuring that injuries are kept to a minimum? Well I think uh, you need to look at uh, the standard of best practice um, just like you would use in an able-bodied sports program. The first thing you want to have is have the athlete go and get a physical examination by a doctor having them uh, having the doctor know what they're intending to do so they can give them a thorough physical and clear them for the activity to begin with. And then if they're cleared for the activity, the current state of that athlete needs to be taken into consideration by the coach or the program administrator so that they can be brought up physically, physically to the level they need to be to possibly practice or to compete. Every athlete's going to have a different starting point just like every able-bodied able athlete does. Everybody can't start at the same pace. It needs to be individualized a little bit to keep them safe. And if an athlete does have some precautions um, that a doctor notices, there again, there are exercise programs that can counteract that and get them up to a level where they can be released for a sports program. So it's all about being smart, being safe, and doing, doing what's basically what common sense says. Get cleared medically, see where you're at. As a coach or a program provider, know that everyone's going to be a little bit differently and cater that program to create a base level of fitness so that everyone can execute the skills, drills, and tactics necessary for that sport. So again, it sounds very basically like the, the recommendations you'd make for working with athletes without disabilities. Pretty much, really the only caveat is you do have to know a little bit more about disability, a little bit more about the individual, and uh, people with disabilities, um, they're competitive just like anyone else, and just like an athlete's an athlete, and they want to hide sometimes certain aches, pains, or injuries. And it may be a little bit easier for an athlete with a disability to do that because of, for instance, wheelchair basketball, you don't have jumping, you don't have lateral movement. Um, you may be able to hide a little tinge here or twinge there. You really need to be perceptive of your athletes just like you would with an able-bodied mm -hmm. athlete and see if they're wincing or, 
or not using one side or the other with as much power as they do and ask questions and really be the protector of the athlete. Excellent. Well, let's move on to myth number three. Sure. Individuals with disabilities are unable to exercise or participate in physical activity programs at a typical fitness facility, <laughs> pool, or outdoor athletic venue. Well, that's obviously false. Uh, there are many athletes with physical disabilities that really require no modifications at all in a typical, say, YMCA or LA Fitness or Gold's Gym. They can make their transfers onto the equipment there, that's there. They can use free weights. They can use them, the machines that are there. But the, for those athletes that do require some assistance, the ADA requires some modifications. Um, pools, for instance, need to be accessible. They can be accessible through um, beach entry pools. They can have chair lifts to put the athletes in the pool. Um, you need to have certain types of equipment available. Most fitness centers will have upper body ergometers available so the person with a disability can get a good upper body workout. For those people who aren't familiar with upper body ergometers, it's basically a cycle for the arms, where an mm -hmm. athlete can sit, pedal with their arms, get that cardio workout, just as they would on a hand cycle, which is a competitive sport. So um, the, more, the more private industry fitness clubs um, realize that there's a market out there for people with disabilities and understand there's also accessible equipment available where seats can swing out, people can pull up to a piece of equipment, use it from their wheelchair, and they get that into their center, they're going to see an increase in people with physical disabilities using that fitness center. Some fitness centers also have basketball courts, and the other thing that's important for, for uh, fitness center operators to understand is that a wheelchair is not going to harm a wood floor. We've got a number of university wheelchair basketball programs out there, all of them playing on wood floors, and they see no adverse effects to that, to that uh, surface. So there's a lot of opportunity for people with physical disabilities to access the community resources, both public and private. It's a matter of the people running those, those centers understanding what accommodations need to be made and really going out and marketing to people with physical disabilities to get them in so they can get that market share. Excellent. Well, myth number four, individuals with a disability are unable to swim or participate in aquatic sports. Again, that is false, um, and we touched about that on the previous questions about uh, adaptations to pools, zero entry pools, and, and uh, chair lifts that can put the per person from a wheel, take the person from a wheelchair into the pool. Um, there are numerous types of aquatic therapies that are out there that can help people with physical disabilities. And swimming is a Paralympic sport. Um, people with visual impairments and blindness, spinal cord injuries, cerebral palsy, brain injury, stroke, um, I forget, am I forgetting a disability class? Dwarfism, all swim at the Paralympic level. I have personally seen at a Paralympic Games an athlete literally with no arms and no legs swimming. Now that's pretty amazing. He has to actually hit his head to finish a race, but he's out there swimming. Now if a person with no arms and no legs can swim, certainly someone who is a paraplegic, has use of their arms, or a quadriplegic with limited arm function can swim. One of America's most decorated swimmers, Curtis Lovejoy, is a quadriplegic and at over 50 years of age is still setting world records in swimming. So from a competitive standpoint, to a recreational standpoint, to a fitness standpoint, swimming is available to a multitude of people with physical disabilities, and it's a great therapy, and it's fun. Um, one of the things that uh, many people, a lot of aquatic therapists like to use is, a slogan they like to use is, we're all equal in the water. Um, additionally, um, getting to different types of water therapies, people with phys physical disabilities can scuba dive. Um, that's something that surprises a lot of people, but what's even more surprising is someone has actually come up with an apparatus to allow people on ventilators to scuba dive. I'm not sure I would want to do that, <laughs> but that's where the ingenuity is, and that's what's possible for people with physical disabilities. Well, I know in, in all of your years in working with Blaze Sports, you've had opportunities to, uh, to go to junior nationals and to, to participate in various Blaze Sports camps and things of that nature. And I'm sure you've seen firsthand some of the kids at the Blaze Camp that have, uh, have, oh. done, have done uh, scuba diving yep. in the pool down in Warm Springs at Absolutely. the Roosevelt Institute. And 
I'm sure you've seen all the wonderful swimmers in uh, mm -hmm. in Tampa at the Junior Nationals. Absolutely. Uh, there's just, uh, you know, it, it's amazing when you see a competition pool, and around that competition pool, a hundred plus kids, and they're crawling, rolling, <laughs> <laughs> walking on prosthetics, taking them off before they uh, get into the water, and then watching them compete swimming. Um, you know, it's it's. Uh, it's a great sport. It's a great cross-training activity, too, for other sports. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, really, you know, when you think about it, swimming is something everybody should know how to do. You never know where you're going to end up in water, and it can save your life. So everyone needs to learn how to swim regardless of ability. Excellent point. Let's move on to myth number five. Individuals with a disability require assistance to participate in sport or physical activity programs. To some extent, that's true, um, obviously, but everyone needs assistance. You don't just throw someone in without any instruction on how to use equipment or how to execute tactical skills. Um, you know, from adaptive equipment, from the wheelchair to a different adaptive equipment, people need to be orientated on the equipment, instructed on the rules, and uh, they need to be given proper coaching. Um, that typically isn't... Um, much of a problem once you get a person with a disability into a program. If there's a program, people there know how to do that. The thing where I think there is a disconnect is letting people, families, and people with physical disabilities know that the opportunities are out there. Because with very, very few exceptions, anything you did as an able-bodied person, if you experience an injury and are now living with a physical disability, you can get back to doing that activity in one way, shape, or form. Maybe a little bit differently. You may be doing it sitting down. You may be doing it with some adaptive equipment, but you can be doing that activity. And it's about learning about those adaptations, what's available, where you can go seek out those resources, and then accessing them. I heard you earlier talking about an individual that you've been uh, doing some work with that, uh, that enjoyed golf. and. Uh, unfortunately had an injury that uh, impacted his life, uh, but he wants to get back to playing golf. Can, can people with disabilities play golf? Absolutely, and, and unfortunately this particular person, uh, in my opinion, probably didn't have the best support network because his friends were joking with him that he wasn't going to play, be able to play golf anymore, and he thought they were right. And We were doing, uh, just having a conversation, and I had, had mentioned something about golf, and he said, I can play golf again? Absolutely, a person with a physical disability play, can play golf. This particular individual, um, I believe, is a T11 uh, paraplegic, and he has a lot of different ways that he can play golf. He can play golf sitting from his everyday wheelchair. He can play one-armed off to the side. Um, if he doesn't want to do that, there are a number of different adapted carts out there that he can use and play golf from. From an adapted cart, it's a little bit easier to play golf two-handed. Um, there's even an adapted cart out there that will stand you up to play golf. And from that cart, you're almost addressing the ball in the exact same position you would be had you not, never had an injury at all. Now, obviously, adaptive equipment is not free in most cases. It does cost money, but there are avenues to get back to it. There are programs that have equipment. There are a number of public courses that have adapted golf carts that are available. So, again, it's a matter of... of for a person with a disability, whether it's golf or tennis or basketball or uh, skeet shooting or hunting, it's a matter of instead of having the mindset of, I can't do this anymore, having the mindset, how am I going to do this again? And then seeking out the resources that will help you with that. And the more we can get the word out that these things are possible, the more people that will, there, that will be out there seeking those resources that are already there. Excellent point. Myth number six, individuals with a disability cannot compete or participate with individuals without a disability. Uh, I love this one because that's absolutely false. And I think one of the best examples of that is uh, what's called either a run roll or a, a up-down tennis format. And that's quite simply a doubles tennis format where one of the partners is in a wheelchair and the other partner is standing up and you play doubles tennis. For tennis, the only real difference is the person playing from a chair gets two bounces to return the ball. Everything else is the same. There you have a person with a disability and without a disability on the same side of the court as a team competing together. You can also have uh, 
people swimming together. You can pe have people racing together. One of the memories I think I will take to my grave is from a junior nationals. We had an excellent runner um, who had uh, um, upper arm uh, impairment, and we had an excellent wheelchair racer uh, that were competing in, the, in those nationals. And a couple of us just happened to notice that their 200 meter times, although they were, they, their races were separate, the 200 meter times were extremely close to each other. And we had this idea, why don't we put them in an exhibition race together and see who'd win. So we set up a 200 meter race, of course it has a staggered start, and we put the wheelchair racer ahead on the stagger because the runner would actually, obviously, have a quicker start off the block. You can go from zero to top speed in four or five steps, whereas the wheelchair racer would take a little bit longer to get up to speed. So the gun goes off. The runner makes up that stagger basically about by the turn. Now they're coming in about even. The racer takes a little bit of a lead and then the racer, the wheelchair racer hits top speed and he overtook the racer literally in the last two feet of a 200 meter race. It was extremely exciting. Wow. 500 people in the stands cheering and we, with that little thing that we just thought would be fun, showed that People can compete in track events side by side, wheelchair and runner, and it's safe and it's fun. That's fantastic. Well, I've had numerous opportunities over the last several years to, to uh, attend some of the up-down uh, tennis tournaments, and I can tell you it's very competitive. Absolutely. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not only competitive, it's great for those athletes, both able and able-bodied and disabled, at, that are good athletes playing a high level of tennis, but it's also a great way to get people introduced to the sport of tennis. Absolutely. Whether or not they have a disability, because you do have a partner there. And what you want to do is have one of the two partners with a little bit of experience to pick up the slack. And mm -hmm. oftentimes, the player with experience is the wheelchair tennis player. So that's pretty amazing. You know, just one more thing to add, too. Um, there also are opportunities for able-bodied athletes elite able-bodied athletes to assist athletes with disabilities achieve their ultimate potential. And two sports that come to mind are cycling and skiing. And of course, with those, we're talking about athletes with visual impairments and blindness where they have to have a guide or a stoker, or a, or a pilot rather. Um, for cycling, the, the blind or visually impaired rider would be the stoker with the pilot being sighted. They'd ride a tandem cycle. In skiing, coming down an alpine mountain, the blind skier would have a guide that would be in front of them, leading them and calling out signals. So, you know, even when you can't see, you can reach an elite level in cycling and skiing, downhill skiing. And isn't that true to some degree in running sports as well for, for people with visual impairment? Absolutely. I can't believe I forgot about that. But track events and road races as well, people with blindness and visual impairments will have a guide runner. Um, in road races, they will run next to each other and keep pace and give them directions in track events. They'll actually have a little tether that are, that uh, um, well they will hold together that they can they don't have to um, and they'll run side by side in lanes so whether you're running cycling um, uh, skiing there's opportunities for elite able-bodied athletes to help produce elite disabled athletes. Well, I recall one of the, the, the legends of uh, visually impaired runners uh, who actually is on the board of directors for Blay Sports, uh, Tim Willis, um, was a very competitive runner in high school in Atlanta. And obviously, because he was per per participating and competing at such a high level, the guide runner that, that trained and competed with him, too, had to be a, a fairly elite oh, yeah. athlete. Absolutely. And then Tim... Correct me if I'm wrong, Tim went on to run competitively on an NCAA team at yes, Georgia Southern. Absolutely. And he not only ran road races and on the track, he ran competitively cross country. So here's a runner with visual impairment running over uneven terrain and doing it at an elite level. So Tim's really an amazing person. Yeah, very incredible. Well, our last myth, or at least the last myth we'll be dealing with <laughs> in this particular video, Physical exertion is harmful to people with disabilities. As with any type of new physical activity regime, you need to consult your doctor. Um, any, any, uh, any physical exertion can be harmful to a person whose body isn't ready for it, and the body needs to be built up for ultimate levels of exertion. But just because you have a physical disability does not mean you can't exert yourself. For instance, let's go back to the beginning of our conversation. 
we've got wheelchair basketball players that can play two, three, four games in a day. That's exerting. They can lose up to 10 pounds in fluids that they need to replenish. That's exerting is all get out. We've got people that are doing, we've got, there's a wheelchair division of the Peachtree Road Race on the 4th of July in Atlanta. It can be 85, 90 degrees by the time that race goes off and they're pushing a 10 kilometer race. That's exerting and no one's keeled over yet, but they've prepared their bodies. So just because you have a physical disability does not mean you can't exert yourself as much as an able-bodied athlete does. What it does mean is you have to prepare your body to go through that exertion, just like an able-bodied athlete would have to prepare their body. I recall a, a particular uh, competition at Junior Nationals one year um, in the powerlifting areas, and, and I'm not sure that powerlifting necessarily is a, a sport that, that you're very familiar with, but I recall that there were uh, two young men competing for the, the championship in their particular weight division, and if my memory serves me correctly, they were bench pressing over 350 pounds. I was not present for that one, but the last impressive powerlifting competition I was privy to at Junior Nationals, I believe we had a 21-year-old uh, powerlifter. It was his last year of eligibility as a junior, and he bench pressed 425 pounds. Wow. Massive chest. And whereas some people might think, well, that's just one up. How, exertion, how, much, how exerting can that be? Well, you need to know a little bit about sports science. You're exhausting your muscles with that one movement. You have to summon all your strength to get that weight up that one time. And the exhaustion in that athlete would be the equivalent of a marathoner running. They're taking their body to exhaustion. They're just taking an hour to do it, whereas this athlete's doing it in two seconds. So it is quite impressive. And again, someone who's paralyzed, no movement from their waist down, built their upper body up to the point where they could lift 425 pounds as a 21-year-old. Well, when I was a younger man, I used to take pride in being able to run the uh, Peachtree Road Race every year, which is a 10K road race in Atlanta on July the 4th, uh, typically a very hot time of year in Atlanta. And granted, the race is run fairly early in the morning to try to find the cool part of the day. But there's a very competitive race that, that, that begins before the runners actually begin, and that's the wheelchair division yep. of the Peachtree Road Race. That requires some stamina, doesn't it? And isn't it a fairly physically exerting activity to, to cover uh, a 10K race in a wheelchair? Absolutely. And for those of you not familiar with the Atlanta area or the Georgia area, it's not a flat race. It's a hilly race. Um, you're going up and down hills, and obviously if you're going down hills in a racing wheelchair, you can coast a little bit, but you have to get up that hill. So it's not just 10 kilometers of flat pushing, pushing, pushing. You have to get up a hill, get over that hill, and as soon as you get down, there's another hill that you have to conquer. So it's extremely exerting. I think our uh, the elite times for the men's division are right in that 20-minute range. I think Saul Mendoza's record is right around 19 minutes for a 10K, which is quite amazing. Um, but that's 20 minutes of just continual exertion. And for those of you not familiar with wheelchair racing, that's just constant movement of your arms on the push rims, getting your, getting your, basically your body weight and the weight of the wheelchair moving and sustaining a maximum speed. So you've got a lot going on there. Of course, those elite racers aren't stopping and picking up water on the sideline. They're going and they're getting done. And, uh, you know, you, you've got to be in shape to be able to, perform at that level and uh, you're quite exhausted when you get done with that. Well, I won't profess to be an expert on that race, but my, if my memory serves me, the typical winning time for the runners is around, for the men, is around 28 minutes, perhaps a little bit less and, and sometimes a little bit more, but generally around 28 minutes. Mm -hmm. so, the, so the wheelchair division is finishing the race a good eight, nine, maybe 10 minutes faster than the runners. Yeah, and that's, that's uh, they reach a higher top speed on flat ground. Obviously, they don't go quite as fast up the hills, but they're still going at a good speed up those hills. But when they hit the downhills, they can reach speeds of 30 miles per hour. So you think, now again, if you're not familiar with Atlanta, the roads aren't always the best. So um, you're not just out there going willy-nilly and not paying attention. You have to pay attention to the road, just like a runner does for potholes. But you're going, I'd say the elite runners are pushing around 15 miles per hour, I think, while they're running, maybe 16 at some points. 
again the wheelchair racers can hit up to 30 miles per hour so very high speeds and again you got to train your body to get up to that it just doesn't happen by getting in the chair and saying oh i'm going to do the peach tree road race it takes a lot of planning takes a lot of sacrifice takes a lot of training it takes well, the same dedication the elite runners have well again it's been a number of years for me but i guess my two biggest memories of the of the various races that that i ran and i wasn't running them competitively i was running them more just to to, to run the race but the two things that stood out the most were the heartbreak hill which mm -hmm. is really a very long uphill right in the middle of the I'll race. It's almost a mile. Yes. I remember the time I ran it. <laughs> uh, my best recollection is that those runners in the race that managed to get ahead of those that were a little bit fitter, we would be running to the hill and all of a sudden we'd look in front of us and there were numerous people walking up the mm -hmm. hill. So that's the same hill that those uh, athletes in wheelchairs have to, to conquer and if they don't keep pushing the wheel, they can't just stop. They have they, to keep pushing right. the wheel or they roll down. Don't go right? backwards. They, uh, yeah, exactly. You don't, uh, as a runner, you do have the option to stop, stand still on a hill, walk up the hill. Wheelchair racer really doesn't have that option. They need to keep those arms going to keep forward momentum because, you know, it is possible to stop on an angle and just hold yourself there, but you're still holding yourself there and exerting force, which is going to tire your muscles out, and you're just not going to make it up that hill. And we've got athletes. We've got uh, uh, the wheelchair division has um, classes for paras and quads, so they're actually quadriplegics. And for those of you that may not be familiar, that doesn't mean they can't move their arms. It means they have limited function in their arms. They're getting up that hill and over that hill and making it the whole 10 kilometers to the finish line. Well, one of the things that I, I spend a lot of time trying to teach my students about the biomechanics of sport is that gravity is always fighting against you, and it never, ever turns itself off. So fighting that hill is a, is a fight against gravity. Yep. The other thing that always... I, 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 I remember fondly of, of the of the race, much more fondly than the hill, is then getting into the park, and then it mm -hmm. becomes a very flat area for the most part mm -hmm. within Piedmont Park, and I would have to assume that that's where the race really is, uh, if if it's close, uh, after having traveled the better part of six miles. Yeah, you really uh, there. There's actually two components to that part of the race. You do have a good flat section as you're approaching the park, and depending on what you're body type is really depends on where you need to be because the last portion of the race is downhill. Now people who have smaller body frames have a better power to weight ratio and will make it up the hills faster but as you said gravity is always working and when they're coming down the hills you don't want to be a light racer next to a heavy racer in head to head because the heavier racer is going to take advantage of that gravity and get down that hill faster than you are. So you, if you're one of the lighter racers, your strategy really has to be to get up those hills fast and create a lead before that final downhill. Otherwise, you may be watching someone that's a little bit bulkier pass right by you at the finish line. So there are even sort of, uh, for lack of a better description, imbalances or whatever between athletes in wheelchairs. You, you mm -hmm. might think that the 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 playing field is is leveled somewhat by that, but there's still factors that come into play, obviously, that where your your body type, uh, mm -hmm. your body strength, your body endurance, play a role. Well, and and just with uh, when you're looking at able-bodied athletes, whether they're going to compete in sprint events or endurance events, uh, do you have fast twitch or slow twitch muscles? I mean, you, that's going to dictate whether or not you're going to be a track athlete and concentrating on the 100 through the 800, or you're going to be a distance athlete going 800, 1500 up through the 5,000, 10,000 in marathons. So, for a wheelchair racer in in the in, in Peachtree, if if their forte is much more being the endurance mm -hmm. athlete as opposed to more of the power wheelchair athlete, they better have a good lead coming into the park because you can assume that with the downhill and with the more power oriented racers, they're going to really be coming on. Exactly. And I can remember some able-bodied races uh, w within wheelchair where two runners came into the park, one of whom was known for his endurance and the other known more for his sprinting ability at the end. And when they hit the park together, you know you knew which one was going to win the race. Yep. Yep. Well, very good. Well, thank you very much, Dan. We really appreciate your time today. Thanks for having me.